If you're a fit young man watching this talk on body fluids and you're a fairly lean young man, then you're going to be about 60% water and 40% solids. If you're a lean young woman watching this talk, you're probably going to be about 50% water. If you have infants, they're going to be proportionally more water, maybe 75% water. But if you're maybe a slightly older man who's maybe a little bit less lean, then proportionately you're going to contain less water. So for example, an obese man of 100 kilograms is probably about 40% fat and only about 44% water. And the difference is, is explained by the different amounts of water that's contained in adipose tissue and in muscular tissue. So whereas adipose tissue can be about 10% water, muscle tissue is going to be about 75% water. So if you've got more fat, you're likely to have less water. But regardless of how the water, or regardless of how much water you have, where is this water? Is it just sort of sloshing around all over the place? Or is it well organised? Well, obviously, as you would expect, we're dealing with human anatomy and physiology, so it's going to be well organised and compartmentalised. So body water, we can divide it into two or three main compartments. One is intracellular, the next is extracellular, and really you could call this transcellular a subdivision of the extracellular, but we normally count it as a third compartment, and that is the transcellular department. So first of all, there's water in the intracellular compartment. Now the intracellular compartment is not really one compartment. It's the compartments in maybe 75 trillion different cells, individual cells in the body. And if you're this stereotypical fit young man, you've probably got about 28 litres of water within the cells. So you know that a cell has an external cytoplasmic membrane and there's a cytoplasm. The fluid in the cytoplasm is the cytosol. And there, that's where this fluid is contained. So the intracellular compartment, not one compartment at all, it's actually about 75 trillion compartments or however many cells there are in an adult body. But that water is contained within the body cells. It's intracellular. And we'll say 28 litres of intracellular fluid. Now, body fluid will also be extracellular, not inside the cells of the body. And here there's two main compartments. Here we've got the intravascular compartment and the interstitial compartment. Now the intravascular compartment, as the name implies, is inside the blood vessels. So it's the blood inside the chambers of the heart, the blood in the arteries, veins and capillaries. And of course, that fluid is supposed to be compartmentalised within that intravascular compartment. And in fact, if blood leaks out of that, we would call it haemorrhage. Now, in this stereotypical fit young man of 70 kilograms, there's probably going to be about five litres of blood and about three litres of that is water. So we've got about 28 litres in the cells and about three litres of water in the blood, in the intravascular compartment. But there's also the interstitial compartment. So the capillaries go through a tissue, the capillaries are going through a group of cells, and in between the cells in a tissue, and in between the capillaries and the cells, we have this interstitial compartment. And it's not really one compartment because it's all over the body, it's a remarkably complex shape, but we count it as one compartment. So the interstitial compartment, and that will contain tissue fluid. And any one time in this fit, ye, lean 
young man, we're going to have about 11 litres of fluid in the tissue spaces. So about 28 litres in the cells, about 3 litres in the blood, and about 11 litres in the tissue spaces. So we can see this is neatly compartmentalised. It's not just sloshing around the place in some random way. But you'll notice here we have a third space. As we've said, some people will classify this as a subdivision of the extracellular space, but today it's going to be a third space. And this, this fluid we're going to describe as transcellular fluid. Transcellular. And this is fluid which is in body compartments. So in this we could include lymphatic fluid. So the lymphatic capillaries are going to drain excess fluid from the interstitial space, together with proteins which may have escaped from the capillaries, together with any infection or indeed malignant cells that the lymph could possibly drain away. But sometimes there's going to be too much lymphatic fluid causing lymphedema and we would get swelling of the affected limb. Now another place where normally there's very small amounts of transcellular fluid is between the two pleural membranes. So you might remember we have the visceral and the parietal pleural membranes and there's a very small amount of serous lubricating fluid between those in health. But of course in pathological situations there could be a pleural effusion. Now an effusion means that fluid has come out of the normal vasculature in which it is supposed to be contained and accumulates in a body cavity. And in this case the body cavity it would escape into is the potential pleural space between the two pleural membranes. So because this is only supposed to be a potential space, if there's a pleural effusion that can turn into an actual space and start to collapse the lung. So pleural effusion, for example, could occur in uh, hepatic cirrhosis. It could occur in malignant conditions if there's metastatic tumours, for example, in the pleural space. That could give rise to a pleural effusion. And this is an example of third spacing. So we're calling this transcellular space the third space. So this would be fluids accumulating a third space, third spacing of fluid. Or we could think about a traumatic situation where blood entered the potential pleural space. And of course, that's a, a hemothorax. Another potential space is between the, not the pleural membranes, but the peritoneal membranes in the abdominal cavity. What do we call it if there's an accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity? You might remember that's called ascites. So there could be third spacing, the accumulation of this transcellular fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Again, in the pathological situation. So in health, there's only a very small amount of serous lubricating fluid between the parietal and the visceral peritoneal membrane. But again, this can accumulate in pathological situations, giving rise to ascites. So, for example, you might see this in liver cirrhosis. Or you might see it when there are metastatic tumours growing within the peritoneal cavity, in the pathological situation. Now, in synovial joints, physiologically, there's going to be a certain amount of synovial fluid. But again, there could be a synovial effusion where more fluid collects in the synovial space. Again, this could be caused by trauma or it could be caused by inflammatory conditions. Or it's also possible that you could get bleeding into the synovial space. That is another, another possibility. That would be a... Um, a hemoarthrosis bleeding into a, a joint. Very likely to be a very painful condition. So again, well, there should be a certain amount of fluid there, but in pathological situations there can be an effusion with more fluid. Now, the pericardial sac of course surrounds the heart, and again you would expect a normal amount of uh, serous fluid there, but a small amount. 
But again, there can be a pericardial effusion. For example, in uh, malignant conditions, you could get this. Or in inflammatory conditions, where there's a pericarditis. Fluid can accumulate in the pericardial sac, causing a pericardial effusion. Or in trauma, blood could accumulate in the pericardial sac. And the big problem here is that as fluid accumulates in the pericardial sac, the pericardial sac is not good at expanding out the way, so it has to expand in the way, and that compresses the heart and interferes with cardiac function, and of course can be life-threatening. That's the condition of cardiac tamponade. Cerebrospinal fluid circulating from the ventricles in the brain, from the choroid plexus where it's produced, round about the cerebrum, round about the spinal cord. It's cerebrospinal fluid. Perhaps you've got about 150 mils of cerebrospinal fluid in the normal situation. But in a condition called hydrocephalus, this can be increased, giving rise to increased pressure in the cerebrospinal fluid and all sorts of adverse neurological consequences that can flow from that. Now, in the eye, there's fluids. So you might remember in the anterior chamber of the eye, we have an aqueous humour. And in the posterior chamber of the eye, we have the vitreous humour. And again, small amounts, perfectly normal, absolutely essential. But this can increase in amount and pressure. And this is called glaucoma. And if that's not treated, the increased pressure can damage the delicate neurological structures in the retina and the optic nerve, eventually leading to blindness. Now, of course, we expect there to be fluid in the urinary lumen. That's going to be normal. If you drink a lot, you would expect to have more urine. If you drink less, you would expect less urine. But that can also have abnormal constituents in this fluid. So, for example, there could be blood in the urine which of course is a pathological situation and needs to be explained. That would be the condition of haematuria. Now, we've mentioned the abdominal cavity, but now we're thinking about the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. There can be increased amounts of fluid in the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. So, for example, you could have a gastrointestinal obstruction giving rise to massive third spacing of fluid within the lumen of the GI tract, possibly giving rise to hypovolemia and shock. Or you could think of inflammatory conditions, where the fluid that's normally secreted by the gastrointestinal tract is not properly absorbed, or inflammatory fluids accumulate into the lumen of the gut. And of course, that would give rise to the condition of diarrhea, with increased amounts of fluid being lost in the stool, in the faeces. So remember, body fluids, intracellular, extracellular, transcellular in the third spaces, abnormal amounts of transcellular fluid occurs in pathological situations. And it's the same with the intravascular compartment. There could be not enough fluid in the intravascular compartment causing hypovolemia, which can cause shock. Or there could be too much fluid in the intravascular compartment for iatrogenic reasons. We might have overinfused these patients. I hope we don't, but it's, it's a possible complication of intravenous therapy that we overinfuse, giving rise to too much fluid in the intravascular compartment. Or the patient could have renal failure and not be able to excrete the fluid. Or the volume of the intravascular fluid could be increased because the patient has congestive cardiac failure, causing a backlog of fluid into the venous system. So again, we want just the right amount of fluid in the intravascular compartment. It would be abnormal not to have enough, and it would be abnormal to have too much. If there's too much, the patient may well develop edema, systemic edema or pulmonary edema. So if the patient's having difficulty when they're lying flat, that might indicate they've got pulmonary edema, especially if that breathlessness is relieved 
when we sit them up. That's a condition called orthopnea, when the patients have difficulty in breathing when lying flat. Or again, if we think of the interstitial compartment, if someone is dehydrated, there may not be enough fluid in the interstitial compartment. Conversely, there might be too much fluid in the interstitial compartment. What do we call it if there's too much fluid in the interstitial compartment? Well, that depends on where you live. If you live in the United Kingdom, we call that edema with an O. If you live in the United States, we call that edema with an E. But it's all the same thing. It's an excess of fluid in the tissue compartments. So we see that body fluids are compartmentalised. Different people are going to have different amounts of body fluid depending on the relative proportions of muscular tissue and adipose tissue in the body. But these fluids are going to be compartmentalised in an anatomically, physiologically, precisely regulated way. Body fluids, intracellular, extracellular, transcellular, intravascular, interstitial, and the examples we looked at of transcellular, lymphatic, pleural, peritoneal, synovial, pericardial, cerebrospinal, intraocular, urinary and gastrointestinal lumen. So, next time you're at work, when you're out on the wards, think about fluids, think about how amazing it is that yours are all properly regulated and controlled, but then observe in your patients for any deficiency of fluid in a particular area or any excess of fluid in a particular area. Recognise that these deficiencies and excesses are pathological, that these deficiencies and excesses are clinical features of pathological situations and should be explained, diagnosed and treated.